Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Fund Insiders Forum. Our next guest is Terry Smith. He's the manager of FundSmith Equity Fund, a fund that outperformed the market by far since its inception in 2010. Thanks to this outperformance, Mr. Smith is named the European Warren Buffett. Welcome, Mr. Smith. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. You're Skyping us from Mauritius, just to make us uh, jealous. Uh, how is the weather there? Well, I'm not sure you should be jealous. It's pretty cloudy today, frankly. Uh, we're on the back end of the Mauritian winter, and so uh, uh, we've got a sort of cloudy, uh, rather rainy day. But uh, nonetheless, you know, we, uh, we're surviving. Thank you. OK, great. Um, well, we have invited you today to give us some insights uh, in your investment uh, process, how you select uh, equities. Quality is a very important factor in this, as you will explain. So please uh, let me give you the floor for your presentation and afterwards we will have a short Q&A. Mr. Smith, the floor okay. is yours. Thank you very much. I've got some slides here which I'm obviously going to run through and uh, uh, I've taken the title as value versus quality, quality uh, in terms of the question you raised. There's, there's the disclaimer, disclaimer which we were required to show by our regulator. I hope that, that uh, you'll take the time to read it. Uh, it's rather long uh, there for you to get through at the moment, but uh, I always paraphrase it. Uh, uh, using uh, a, a CEO of a company that we follow, Church and White, who once said, if you trust what I say and buy my stock, it's your problem. That's roughly the gist of what that says. Um, uh, value versus uh, quality. Uh, points, uh, points I, would I would hope that I can establish to you in the course of this presentation. To you. One is that this is not a debate about value versus growth. It's a debate about value versus quality. Uh, the second is, is that growth, uh, and the re this is part of the reason why we're not talking about value growth, growth is a component of valuation. Right? It needs to be considered when you think about valuation. And uh, 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 growth in a company can either be a positive or a negative, depending upon the sort of returns or capital that it's, uh, it's generating. Um, valuation should always be a secondary consideration, I would say to you. I think an awful lot of people throughout my investing life, which now uh, extends to about 46 years, spend most of their time thinking about whether something is cheap or expensive. Um, and whilst that's not something that I do, I think it is a secondary consideration. It is not the primary consideration. Primary consideration is quality. And the last thing I'd like to try and establish is that quality in the companies and equities you invest in will always win out over the long term as an investment uh, methodology. Um, first of all, what is value investing? When you see this uh, phrase banded about an awful lot, um, it's about buying a stock below its intrinsic value. What's the intrinsic value of a business, which most people would say uh, it amounts to the discounted present value of its future expected cash flows in some form. Well, how much cash will it generate over its over a horizon and discounting that back to uh, present value is roughly it. The kind of the, the father of, uh, of value investment is Ben Graham. Uh, he was the author of uh, Security Analysis and the Intelligent Investor, and famously taught uh, Warren Buffett in his time at Columbia University. And of course, his pupil, Warren Buffett, who uh, certainly in his early years of running Berkshire Hathaway, was an adherent of value investing, and of trying primarily to buy a stock below its, uh, its intrinsic worth. Um, it's, in my view, become incorrectly associated in more recent years by other practitioners with the simplicity of just buying things which are lowly rated, that people look at simply the low valuation. They don't do the bit about looking at the valuation versus the intrinsic value, because of course something can be lowly valued, but not lowly valued enough if it's a poor business. Um, this kind of illustrates that point, I think. This is an interesting chart in my view. It takes uh, a number of stocks, uh, all of the sort that we seek to invest in at Fundsmith, so uh, things like consumer staple stocks in particular, you see heavily represented here, some consumer discretionary stocks. And it looks at the PE you could have paid if you bought these stocks at the beginning of 1973, and held them through to 2019, so a pretty long period, a period with uh, inflation and then deflation, uh, with a number of recessions and crises of various sorts, so a pretty long sweep of investment history. And it says, during that period, the MSCI World Index delivered a return of 6.2% per annum. And what we've got here is somebody who's gone back and computed what PE or price earnings ratio you could have paid for some of these stocks and beaten that index. What could you have paid and got a 7% ROI? 
compound annual growth rate in the value of your investments. You can see that at the top of the chart, 7% CAGR. And you can see in 1973, you could have paid 281 times L'Oreal's earnings that year and still beaten the index over the period down to 2019. Uh, you could have paid 126 times for Colgate, and you could have paid 100 times for PepsiCo. Um, and you see, the people who really adhere to value investing as equally low as equally low valuation miss the point that presumably, looking back at this now, uh, buying L'Oreal at less than 281 times earnings, you were buying it below what seems to have been established as its intrinsic value. That is an extremely important point, which I think we are generally bad uh, at managing to figure out. Um, Having said what value investing is, what's quality investing, which um, we at Fundsmith endeavour to apply? We're looking for companies with a high return on capital. This, I, I think, is the primary measure of financial performance by a company. Does it make a high return on the capital employed, which, after all, is a shareholder you partially own? You also need to look for a source of growth. There's no good having high returns if you don't have anything to invest in in the future, because most companies distribute about half of their earnings. The other half that they retain is reinvested in the business in some form uh, in this source of growth, and that delivers incremental returns over the future. It is the source of compounding, which is the single uh, characteristic of equities, which in my view is not commented on enough. Equities are a unique asset class. Unlike any other asset class, a portion of the return for the investor, the cash flows of the earnings, is retained by the company and reinvested on your behalf. That doesn't happen in real estate. It doesn't happen in bonds. And also, fundamentally, we're looking for companies with a sustainable competitive advantage. This is the famous Warren Buffett moat. It's no good having great returns uh, if you aren't able to fend off the competition, because otherwise, the competition will enter your uh, market and drive your returns down towards uh, the average or even possibly below. So that's what we are seeking when we talk about um, quality investing. Um, Buffett himself made a transition. He started as a, a value investor, uh, as a disciple of Ben Graham. But people often forget that he was also taught at Columbia University by a man called Philip Fisher, who wrote a book called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. And Philip Fisher was really a disciple of the quality investing in the, in the sense I've described it, looking for companies with high returns and a source of growth in which to reinvest to compound in value. He was also very affected by Charlie Munger, the vice chairman of, uh, of Berkshire, uh, who I think has got more of a bent towards quality investing than value investing, uh, which you'll see in some of the quotes I'm going to give you. Um, Buffett himself agrees with us, I think, on the primary measure of, of what's a quality business, a high return on capital. Here's a quote from his 1979 annual report to investors uh, in Berkshire, where you see he says, the primary test of managerial economic performance is the achievement of high earnings rate on equity capital employed, a high return on equity capital employed. This is, in his view, the primary measure of performance. Now, since he wrote that in 1979, it's been almost universally ignored by the investment uh, industry. Uh, I always uh, say I have a blind bet with people who are the uh, recipients of investment research about companies. Uh, and if they pick out 10 random pieces of research, how many of them, those 10, will say that the thing that we should most look at in this company that's being analysed is return on capital? I'll bet you that none of them say that. I'll have a blind bet of the sort of statutory view. I don't know five euros with anyone watching this. There. On the other hand, when they've lost that bet to me, and I think they will lose it, I'll give them what they call a double or quits opportunity. I'll bet you that all 10 of them mention earnings per share. You'll see that Buffett's quote goes on to say, the primary test is not the achievement of consistent gains in earnings per share, which people, of course, uh, obsess about, uh, whereas they don't give much consideration to the return on capital employed. Um, here's a, another quote. This one is from Munger, who, as I say, really uh, drove Buffett, I think, or helped to drive Buffett towards quality investment. Over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn a much better return than the business which underlies it earns. I don't know why he picked this period or these numbers, but he says, if the business earns 6% on capital over 40 years, and you hold it for that 40 years, you're not going to make much different than 6% return. And this is the punchline, even if you originally buy it at a huge discount, so if you're buying it as a value investment. Conversely, if a business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, even if you pay an expensive looking price, you'll end up with one hell of a result. He's saying, look at the quality of the returns in the business, not at the price. Here's an illustration of why Munger is right. I mean, this is not a supposition. This is just a mathematical fact. Imagine your investment career over 40 years and you're given a choice between company A and company B. Um, 
There's their return on capital employed, or ROC. Company A does 20% per annum return. Company B does 10%. After me talking about return on capital employed and pointing out what Buffett and Munger say, presumably you would select Company A with a 20% return. Um, oh, by the way, neither of them pays a dividend. And both of them reinvest all of their earnings in the business. So there's no complication of that sort to take into account. But if only life were that simple. When you go to buy the shares, the shares at the start of the 40 years, A is trading on four times book value. So its share price is four times its tangible book value. Um, whereas B, unsurprisingly, is much more lowly rated. It's only on two times book value. So as a value investor, you might well be driven towards B, I suspect, now, uh, as a result of that. It gets worse. When you come to sell them at the end of the 40 years, so you can go off and uh, buy some bonds or whatever you're going to do, um, I've no idea why this has happened, but the rating of A is half. It's gone down to two times book value, and B is enjoying uh, a period in the sun in the stock market, and on that day, it's on four times book value. Now, this is a bit tricky. Which share would you like to own now? Um, the answer is rather surprising. The column CAGR, compound annual growth rate, uh, which I'm about to reveal, is the what the share price would have done over this period. Because believe it or not, we have a, a spreadsheet that can show this to you. You now have all the data to tell you what would have happened to the share price in your investment during this period. Um, and there's the answer. In A, your terrible timing and lack of um, attention to valuation reduced the company's 20% return to 18% return of the share price. And company B, your uh, great value investing and timing got you from 10% to a 12% return. If you are a long-term investor, it's the quality of the company and the returns it generates which drive your returns. Um, Buffett really encapsulated it much better than I can encapsulate it in his 1989 Sherrill letter where he said, it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price. That's not a statement of a value investor. That's a statement of a quality investor. Um, here's a real life example. It's already one we're putting up company A and company B. I know quite often people look at those and they kind of glaze over. Here's a real company. Uh, this is a consumer company. It's one that you'll be familiar with probably. Uh, I'll reveal what it is in a moment. You can see here's three years sales. You can see they rise from about 15 billion US dollars to 19 billion US dollars over the period. It's growing at about 8% per annum, I think. And you can see the net income is keeping place for that. It goes from 901 million US dollars to uh, 1 billion and, uh, and 80 million US dollars. So uh, it's growing at about 8 to 10% per annum. These are not unusual years, I promise you, in its history. It's not highly leveraged. Um, if you're an investor, would you pay a PE of 10 for this company? Would you buy it, the whole company, if you could, for 10 times its net income? So $11 billion, you can see at the bottom of the chart there, still the slide there. Yeah, I, I reckon you would. Would you buy it on 20 times? Would you pay $22 billion to buy this company? Hmm. I think the value investors amongst you would start to balk at 20 times. How about 30 times? I don't think any of you would buy it at 30 times. 40 times, we didn't even begin to discuss it. Now, let's have a look at this company in real life. It's a company called PepsiCo, which you're probably familiar with. Um, I didn't actually sort of uh, tell you any fibs or lies in the last slide, but I slightly misled you because uh, I put up a slide which said 2014, 15, and 16, you'll see there. Actually, those years were 1989, 90, and 91, you can see in the right, the history. The reason I did that to slightly trick you is because 1991 was 25 years ago when I made this slide up in 2016. So we can say, what happened in the meantime and whether our judgment on where to buy these shares would have been a good one. You can see the sales went from 19 billion US to 62 billion US. They roughly trebled, a bit more than trebled during the period. The company has some operational gearing, uh, so it's got some fixed costs, so that increase in revenues is beneficial to the bottom line. So you can see the net income went from 1 billion and 80 to 6.6 .6 billion, nearly uh, over a six times increase in the, in the profits of the company. Pretty good. Uh, and the market value went from 27 billion US to 146. It kept pace with the net income, unsurprisingly. Um, a footnote, by the way, the PE ratio went from 25 times to 22 times over that 25 years. Uh, we're consistently being told that these companies are more expensive than, than they ever were. Doesn't look like it to me. Um, OK, what sort of return would you have got from that market performance over those 25 years? Well, if you'd go along and bought it on a P of 10, which I think most of the people would do, you'd have got 14.3% per annum. 20 times, 11.1% per annum. 30 times, 9.3% per annum. Look at the bottom of the slide. The S&P 500 did 9.1% per annum during this period. This is the most difficult market index in the world for a fund manager to be. You could have paid 32 times earnings that equaled that index. If you bought it on a P of 30, you'd have outperformed the index during this period. How many of you would have done that? Would I even do that? Um, why don't we get that? Here's an illustration, uh, I hope. 
This is 30 years, and you've got $1,000 to invest, and you get a 10% compound return from your investment, a number not far out from what we've been looking at in terms of those uh, uh, examples with PepsiCo. So your $100 of interest in the first year would obviously rise, and your capital sum would, uh, with the compounded interest, grow from $1,000, you can see to the bottom right there, illustrated $17,449.40. How about a 12.5% compound return? What do you think that would do to your capital sum? Would it make it 25% less? 10% goes to 12.5% return? 25% less? What do you think? This is, uh, you know, are we good at the mental imaging of, of how compounding works? No. If you invested your $1,000 and got 12.5% return, you would have ended up with $34,243. You get 100% higher return for a 2.5% extra compound rate of return on 10%. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I think it is anyway. Um, again, let's look at reality. So here we have 1979 to 2009. Uh, so we can see here we've got uh, 40 years, so we're sort of keeping to the time scale that uh, Charlie Munger was uh, suggesting in that example that he, uh, that he gave in his quote. The S&P in 1979 was on 107.9, 2009 it was on 1,115.1. Coke, Coca-Cola shares were 72 cents in 1979. They weren't literally, obviously, they've been splits in the meantime. Uh, and in 2009, they were on $28.50. Uh, the S&P gave an 8% return. Uh, Coke gave a 13% return, so 5% more. If you include reinvested dividends, the returns are 11 to 16, 5% apart. What difference does a 5% return make on those kind of returns? Think back to that example of 10 and 12.5%. And okay? The answer is pretty startling. Um, you can see here, this is actually done with $100 rather than $1,000. The $100 at 11% uh, uh, grows to $2,289 at the end of the, the 40 year period. Uh, the $100 at 16% grows to $8,585. You get 3.75 times more capital for the 5% increase in compound return. Well, what that's telling you is this. The P's of those two stocks, and this is why I chose this as my starting date, uh, not for any reason that it suits me, but there happened to be a period when the P of Coke and the P of the S&P were pretty similar. You can see that Coke was on 10.1 times earnings in 1979. The S&P was on 10 times. You, that calculation is telling you you could have paid 38 times, 3.8 being the, the amount of extra capital that you, you got from that, from that compound. You could have paid 38 times for Coke's earnings. Uh, in uh, 1979 and equaled the S&P. Right. And now I know some of you viewing this will think, ah, but the P is an awful lot more than 10 now, isn't it? It's about relative valuation okay, that, that we're talking. Where are we now? Coke's, when I last looked, making up these slides a few days ago, Coke was on 22 times earnings and the S&P is on 23. Coke's slightly cheaper than the S&P at the moment. Now I know 22 is higher than 10, 23 is higher than 10, but interest rates in 1979, when we were making this up, were uh, on their way to the point where U.S. Treasuries were yielding 16% during this period. Uh, interest rates now are approximating zero, as you know. I mean, obviously, the long term, a couple of percent. Uh, this is an important consideration in terms of valuation. So that really underscores the, the, the sort of the numbers in terms of uh, the 22 versus the 10. But uh, in terms of the compounding, unless Coke is going to be markedly worse than the S&P over the coming period, it looks like an interesting situation. Um, notwithstanding this evidence, you get an awful lot of commentators who will tell you that this is uh, uh, about to change. This is a, a quote from a publication called Investment Advisor from 13th of August 2012. And the reason I show it to you is it's the first time that I saw a reference to our fund uh, or our strategy saying that things were going to go wrong. Looking at P ratios, there is, there is evidence in abundance that shows that from a relative perspective, quality stocks may today be considered expensive. 13th of August, 2012. Um, you would give up an awful lot of relative performance if you would follow this advice, but it doesn't stop people dispensing it. Um, this is an interesting chart. This is the MSCI World Quality Index. You can get subsectors of the MSCI index. Uh, you can get quality uh, as one of them. And it compares it with the return on the index as a whole over uh, the period, as you can see here, from 1996 uh, to 2020, which is the longest we could get data for, 34 years. And you can see 
it look, computes the excess return. So what did quality deliver over the index? And you can see there's never been a rolling 120 month period. That's the heading you can see, rolling 120. Never been a 10 year period when quality didn't outperform value. Now, I know 10 years is a long time. And I know people will say, oh, there's bound to be a period when, uh, within 10 years when value will outperform quality. I agree with you, there will be. But if you are a long-term investor, quality will always win. Now, my view is if you're not a long-term investor, you shouldn't be invested in equities at all. But um, obviously, that's up to you. I certainly know you shouldn't be invested in our fund uh, during this period. I mean, bear in mind this calculation that's been done here uh, handicaps quality because it's comparing the quality index with the index. What you could really do if you wanted to do this manually is compare the quality subsector with the index minus quality, which is what a lot of value investors were doing. Then you get some markedly worse results in terms of value versus quality. Um, here's what our fund has done over the, uh, the period. I've just taken the date of that investment advisor comment, 30th of August 2012. You see that our fund, uh, in terms of the Euro CCAP, is up 250% uh, versus 132% for the benchmark MSCI World Index. Quality has outperformed pretty consistently over this 10-year period. Um, lastly, I'll finish with this. Um, I took a photograph of this because uh, as much as I lecture about these things and I talk about quotes from uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and what Philip Fisher wrote and give you examples of, of all these things, uh, I sometimes think that other people in life uh, have uh, more simply reached the, the right conclusion with regard to investment. You don't see these uh, very much anymore um, because uh, they've kind of died out in the, in the developed world to a considerable degree because we've all got uh, home freezers and so on. But uh, uh, certainly when I was growing up, uh, the world had plenty of ice cream vans which were two of the neighborhood and, uh, and sell you an ice cream cone. Uh, and in Mauritius, uh, we still get these uh, around. This is a sort of middle income country. So uh, uh, we still have some things which probably existed uh, during my childhood uh, in Mauritius, which is one of the things I rather like about it. You can see this ice cream vendor has worked out its quality that counts. And uh, I would say as investors, it's very important for us to um, uh, bear that in mind, because I think if you are a long-term investor, it is what works. Anyway, I'll stop there and hand it back to you, if I may, to uh, uh, face your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith, for this uh, very inspiring uh, presentation. Let me come back on some points uh, you mentioned. You talked about the fact that quality is uh, more important than value in selecting companies. But how do you look uh, at the quality of successful tech companies uh, like um, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix and Google Alphabet, uh, um, better known as the FANGs? Yeah, um, I find these sort of acronyms, which you only obviously you only touch upon in that, unhelpful in investment. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're snappy and uh, and people use them a lot, but I don't think they help. Um, uh, you know, you may recall that back in about 2000 or so, uh, Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs uh, came up with his acronym, the BRICS. And if you'd have invested on the basis of buying the BRICS, you'd have had some markedly different performances because the economic growth and currency performance of, of China versus, say, Brazil has been uh, like chalk and cheese in terms of the difference. So I'm not always sure acronyms help. And I think in FANGs, they're quite unhelpful as well. We have some very different businesses within the FANGs. Uh, you know, we have um, Facebook, which is a social media and online advertising business, Apple, which is a consumer electronics business, Amazon, which is a, a, a retail e-commerce and, and cloud services business, Netflix, which is a, a media streaming and content business, and Google Stroke Alphabet, which is an online search and advertising business. They're pretty different, and their results are pretty different as well. I mean, if I give you an example, Amazon is on a P of 127 at the moment and only makes a return on capital employed of 9%. I'm not very impressed with either of those two things, even though, as I say, value is a secondary consideration. It's not a non-consideration. Um, on the other hand, Apple is on a P of 36, which is not low, but bear in mind it makes a 29% return on, on invested capital. So on Charlie Munger's sort of 40-year approach, um, if you think it's going to continue doing that for that 40 years, could be quite interesting. So I don't think actually looking at them as a unit is terribly helpful. I think you need to look at them individually uh, and think about uh, about what they are. The other thing about uh, people who rely upon the FANGs as an acronym to think about is they miss some quite important companies. I mean, we own Microsoft, which is not a FANG, and there's no N in FANG, and that's over one and a half trillion dollars in market capitalization. But clearly, whoever came up with the FANG acronym, uh, it didn't fit. 
So if we're thinking about companies, first of all, I think acronyms don't help all that much. Secondly, uh, you know, I think you need to analyze what are the returns on capital, what is the growth rate, what business is it in, what competitive advantage has it got. I'm quite attracted to some of these businesses. Um, you know, I'm attracted to Facebook, which we own, because it dominates uh, the world of, uh, of social media, telecom communications, and is in a um, is in a duopoly with uh, Google Alphabet in online advertising, and has been pretty much profitable almost from day one. Uh, whereas, rightly or wrongly, I'm quite puzzled by Amazon because Amazon has never really made an adequate return on capital, um, and uh, and therefore, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a grand plan one day to attain an adequate return by some method, or whether it's as uh, one of the commentators on Wall Street, I think it was Twiggy Brown, which uh, co coincidentally or not is the firm where Warren Buffett started his career, described Amazon as a, um, a, a charity run for the benefit of consumers and funded by Wall Street. And I'm inclined to believe that's the case. Uh, so I think when you're thinking about them, it's very important to think about individual companies. Although you can get, uh, obviously, uh, um, derivative contracts which do uh, give you the set, as it were, I mean, most people who are investing are going to invest in stocks. And therefore, I think it's the individual stock that you need to think about rather than them as a group. Okay, that's clear. Now, if you look at the past months, uh, we had a rather bumpy ride for the stock markets uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Has the composition of your fund changed um, due to this uh, virus? Um. Not directly due to the virus, I would say, uh, and not very much. We, we tend to be fairly um, uh, somewhere between sort of glacial and lethargic when it comes to changing our, our portfolio because uh, we are believers that uh, uh, the stock market is, uh, is a mechanism for transferring money from the active to the patient. So we don't deal very much. It's a, kind of a black armband day for the broking industry if everybody ran money like us. So we don't make very many changes. But when we have an incident like the, uh, the, the downturn in the market, which occurred in March uh, because of the impact of the virus or the impact of the economic measures that surrounded the, the, the governmental measures that had an economic impact from the virus, we look for opportunity. What we did was we sold one stock and we bought two. Um, the stock we sold was Clorox. It's an American consumer products company. Uh, its main uh, products are bleach, cleaning products, sanitation products. And as you could imagine, it had a spectacular performance uh, over this period with people uh, wanting as much uh, antiseptic white bleach and hand sanitizer as they could lay their hands on and, and got somewhat re-rated. Um, our view is that that's probably a temporary phenomenon. So as much as we like the business, uh, it got to a valuation which we thought was problematic. So, you know, uh, to, just to emphasize, I'm not somebody who ignores valuation, it's just a secondary consideration. Um, at the same time as that was happening, two companies which we followed um, and which we would like to have owned, which, which had looked a bit expensive to us, um, had a very bad time because of the, uh, the market fall. And we bought both of them. The two companies concerned are Nike, the, uh, the world's leading uh, sportswear uh, supplier, uh, and Starbucks, uh, which is the, uh, the biggest supplier of, uh, of, of, of uh, coffee through uh, QSR format type restaurants uh, out there. And both of them fell over 40% in March. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, both of them are companies which, if you look back in history, have had returns on capital around about uh, 30%, and which historically have been growing around about 7 to 10% per annum. Now, obviously, the future may look different to the past, but when you're looking at that future, I think a couple of things, uh, when we were looking at it as well in terms of buying, a couple of things to caution. Obviously, the growth rate went down very markedly during the period of, of, of the severe lockdowns, yes, but that probably won't persist forever. When you're buying these things for a medium to long-term investment, you have to think about what will happen eventually. And when you're thinking about that, both of them had a degree of change for the positive, in my view, uh, during the, the period of the, of the market downturn caused by the, the COVID uh, measures. Uh, in the case of Nike, uh, they are already the, by far the leading uh, retailer of sports goods in the online market. And they have, all of the market research surveys show that their online penetration uh, increased in leaps and bounds with consumers during this period. And I think that's a, a very big positive for them. In the case of Starbucks, um, whilst they had lockdown uh, problems and their, their uh, uh, internal use of their restaurants was uh, heavily restricted uh, or, or even not available, um, uh, it, their biggest, uh, the second biggest market is China. And their biggest competitor in China, Luckin Coffee, was uh, 
revealed to be a fraud during this period. Um, uh, in that way, epitomizing another great saying in investment, which is only when the tide goes out that you find out who's swimming naked. And, uh, and so their biggest competitor was, uh, was neutered uh, by these events in their second biggest market, which we think is a positive. So those are the changes uh, which we made. Okay. Another event investors are looking at are the U.S. presidential elections. Uh, will these elections have an impact on your uh, stock selection? I don't think so. No. Um, uh, look, certainly not in advance of the election and possibly not after it either. I think um, in terms of people thinking about the election as, as an event in the future to deal with uh, in terms of uh, positioning themselves, I think uh, it's frankly a complete waste of time to try and predict what will happen. Um, I say that for two reasons. One is most of the, uh, the cephologists or commentators, uh, the election pollsters, uh, seem to have, uh, have lost their ability to focus on what will happen and spend most of their trying to, to cause things out. As a result, they quite frequently get this wrong. Um, but the other problem is markets are second order systems. What do I mean by that? In order to um, use an event like this to position yourself, you not only need to accurately predict the events and its outcome, you need to know what the market is discounting. Um, uh, so, you know, um, for example, in the run-up to the 2016 election, we were told pretty consistently that Donald Trump would win. Uh, and then we were told, but even if that was wrong, the market would have a, a very bad time when Trump won because of the uncertainty of what his presidency would look like. Well, Donald Trump won and the market saw it. Uh, similarly, close to the home, as it were, uh, we were told that uh, uh, Remain would win in the Brexit uh, referendum in the UK. Uh, but if by some chance uh, leave was uh, to succeed, that the UK would immediately enter uh, not only the market downturn, but a recession, neither of which was right. And so, you know, betting that you know the outcome between Trump and Biden, I think, is, is problematic. Um, and even if you really do know it, so, you know, Biden's going to win, which seems to be probably where the, uh, the, the, the betting is at the moment, and therefore it's going to be very bad for business uh, and the market, well, perhaps the market's already figured that out. So uh, doing that is probably problematic. If we do get a change of regime, we'll have a think about it subsequently. I mean, the, uh, in the run-up to the 2016 election, when a lot of people um, were doing hand-wringing to me about the possibility of a Trump presidency, um, I said to them, I, I actually studied history. I'm a history graduate uh, in terms of my degree. And I said, uh, actually, one of my best papers, probably my single best paper, was American history. And I, if I, my study of American history is accurate, I would say the American political system has more checks and balances on executive action than, than any other system that I've ever studied. Um, and so you know, the problem might not be that Trump is elected and he does something bad. The, the problem might be that no American president could do anything very much. Uh, and so, you know, the, the place where Rumble on in its pretty generally successful way, kind of whoever's sitting in the Oval Office. And, and I would suggest the intervening years may have prove that to be the case. So, look, we'll evaluate it after, the, you know, people say, well, if Biden is elected, there'll be problems for the tech stocks like Facebook and so on. Well, maybe, um, but we'll evaluate that when we get there. There may be a problem in terms of, uh, of Medicare and, uh, and pricing for drugs and so on and so forth. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of mostly of the view that it's not wise to panic ahead of knowing what the facts are on these things. I mean, I always point to things like uh, uh, stocks, which if you <laughs> Of the, of the 1960s, stocks like uh, uh, Xerox, uh, copy of uh, thing, or in instant cameras, uh, where the writing was on the wall in terms of the digital age for uh, many, many years before you needed to take uh, corrective action if you have them in your portfolio. So we'll wait and see what happens. Okay. A question that is burning on the lips of our Belgian uh, viewers. Are you invested in Belgian companies today? Uh, no, we don't have any Belgian companies. I mean, if I look at the major Belgian companies, and obviously we're mainly interested in big companies. We, we run a, a fund which is uh, uh, well over uh, uh, 20 billion pounds uh, uh, in, in the UK and, uh, and a, quite a large sea cap, which your readers may be interested in as well in addition to that. Um, you know, we're going to be buying leading companies. And if you look at the major companies in the, uh, uh, in the Belgian market, you're talking about brewing, banking, insurance, chemicals, um, none of these are really of great interest to us. I mean, banking, we would never own a bank, we would never own an insurance company. I can give you the reasons for that if you would like to, uh, to have them. Um, and, uh, and the largest company, Brewing. Brewing is a 
uh, structurally challenged industry in any event, I think, because of uh, two very big trends. One is uh, the movement, particularly of younger consumers, away from drinking beer and towards drinking wine or spirits more particularly. And the other one is the rise of the craft brewer, that people set up microbreweries which produce pretty good product uh, that can challenge them locally. It's a very difficult industry to make uh, work on an international basis. In every single country of the world, from the largest to the smallest, the dominant beer is a local beer. Uh, there aren't really very big global brands in Britain. So if you go to China, it's snow. If you go to Jamaica, it's red stripe. You know, it's uh, it's really a very difficult industry to uh, to make truly global brands out of. So uh, no, we don't own any Belgian companies. Okay, very good. N nevertheless, we have some Belgian companies with high dividend yields. How important is this dividend yield uh, for you in your selection of uh, the companies? Um, not at all. Uh, uh, important to us. Um, you, in my view, you should never invest in equities for income. Uh, you should invest in equities for the greatest total return that you can get. So that's the growth in the share price plus any income. And if you need to spend some money, sell some of your holdings, which I know is a natural to some people, but I assure you is, is the correct way to do this. Um, you know, the ideal company doesn't pay a dividend. And if a company can make 30% return on capital, um, why would you want it to pay you a dividend? You, by and large, can't make a 30% return on capital, so you want it to retain the earnings and generate that return for you. Um, and uh, uh, that's something which I touched upon in the presentation, this unique uh, facet of equities or, or, uh, that they've got, this unique characteristic of retaining part of your earnings for you and reinvesting it. If they do that in a high quality business with high returns on capital, they will compound in value much better than you can with the dividend that they pay you. And people say, oh, well, you could always take the dividend and reinvest it. Yes, after you've paid the tax, primarily. I mean, I know you might have it in a non-taxable account. Uh, but you know, aside from that, you're basically, it's an inefficient mechanism. There are dealing costs and tax uh, to take into account. I guess the, the, the thing that seals it more than anything for this is Berkshire Hathaway, the famous infamous Warren Buffett's company, uh, which he took control of in June, I think it was, in 1965, and which, at least until recent years, very recent years, was uh, probably the greatest investment performance uh, post-World War II in terms of its performance, has never paid a dividend. Okay, a final question. Uh, the fund sector is increasingly driven by data and computers. Think about the growth of passive funds, uh, trackers. How do you see the role of a human uh, fund manager uh, in the future? Yeah, I, you're right. It is uh, increasingly dominated by the uh, by computers and uh, and various applications of uh, smart beta or artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, you know, and I think that will grow. My my view is that will grow. It will grow for a number of reasons. One is most active managers are producing a bad result for uh, for people. You know, about seventy five percent of U.S equity active managers underperform the index. So why would you pay them rather than buying an index fund uh, or, or an ETF? Um, and there are drivers beyond that as well. I mean, American 401ks, which are big investors, um, are managed basically by the uh, HR manager of the company, who gives the employees the accounts they can invest in. And a thing called, I think it's called the SECURE Act, makes the company liable for any bad outcome like underperform of the index. Well, naturally, faced with that, the 401k is always going to be invested in some form of index fund. And so there is a big driver in this, in this respect, low cost, poor performance by active managers, uh, things structured like 401ks drive it. Um, look, I think the best thing for an active manager, providing you have uh, certain qualities, is to be the last active manager left because you will be the last person in the investment industry who is licensed to think and act logically uh, rather than just going with weight of money. Um, having said that, it could be an uncomfortable place to be because uh, the weight of money does drive uh, investment in certain areas. You, know, you mentioned the fangs earlier in our presentation. Um, and uh, you know, it's quite clear that large companies do their market capitalization attracts inflow into the index funds into their into their stock and that can become extreme and if you are somebody who wants to stand out from that uh, it could become very uncomfortable you need to be pretty sure of your own methodology and have clients who are prepared to be long-term enough to stay with you and that's a fairly rare combination but but if you have that combination i think being the last active investor in uh, in business would be a great place to be Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, for uh, having you here. 
I'm sure you inspired some of our participants to become a Belgian Warren Buffett uh, soon. So uh, thank you. Thanks again uh, for your presence at the Fund Insiders Forum. Thank you.